terribly mentally disturbed world. You've heard of road rage. People get mad on the road, and people get mad at work, and people get mad in the grocery store. Uh, people mentally insane. Burnout folks. People who are super sensitive and super silly and headstrong and eccentric. They're all over. But I believe, I believe, Brother Shade, that a lot of that comes from the way the home is structured. It wasn't allowed in our house with my dad and mother. I mean, they put a stop to it right now when you get to quarreling and bickering. I wouldn't allow it my children. I know they did. There were kids and all that kind of stuff. But it wouldn't be tolerated. It would be taken care of. And uh, I feel so sorry for people that don't and didn't have a good home life. I, 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 can't, I can't thank God enough for a good mother and dad. I saw Christianity work in the lives of my mom and dad. I liked it. I liked, I liked what I saw. And I adapted to it young. I was nine years old when I embraced Christianity, become a Christian, because I was seeing it every day. And I think, I, are you listening to me? I think children have to see Christianity work. And if it doesn't work for mom and dad, it won't work for them either. You understand what I'm talking about? And uh, I think that the home, it, as it talks in our verse, the structure of it, the building of it, it's sort of the foundation not only for this for society to, and for a sane mind, but it also is for the security, the um, financial security of a child. A child, if he's taught, taught right, he'll be trained to work. He'll be trained to prepare for his future of getting an education, a training, so that he can equip himself to make a living for himself. And if a home is right, they'll teach integrity and, and responsibility and regularity and consistency, getting up, going to work, and being faithful to those that have employed you. Um, and teaching you to regard one another and live in a family unit, but also on the job to get along with those people around about you. I know people that cannot hold a job because they cannot get along with everybody. Yeah, you want to, I don't know what there is about it, about it all, but uh, if you could just learn the values of cooperation, value of money. I think it's a, I think the home is the beginning of everything. I think also it is a foundation for a, a sound marriage and a solid marriage where the sanctity of that marriage is demonstrated in front of the children. That solemn vows are to be made when you get married, and they are for one man, for one wife, for one life. There is divorce ought to be a word that is taboo. You ought to be able to work your way through your problems. Some I realize, and I'm not a knucklehead, I realize that there are some people that nobody could live with. I understand that. And God has made some provisions for such things in the scripture, and I'm not going to get on that subject, but I'm trying to say is that if there was uh, uh, understanding about 
for better, for worse, for richer, for poor, in sickness and in health, until death you do part, that most of these families that are busting up, if they could, they could really make a go of it if that was trained in the home to be faithful to your mate, to be honest, to be a hard worker, and to be morally straight, and to honor your wife and honor your husband, and uh, the precept and example of that would be before your eyes in your mother and your father. I, I'm just saying, it takes a lot to put a home together, a lot of work. I think it also, uh, if everything is equal, I would think if you would love to see your children saved, I think the home is a foundation for the soul's salvation, groundwork at least for it, that uh, you could prepare their hearts with the Bible and understanding of how that they are to trust the Lord to get saved. You do what you want to do. I've already raised mine, and I'm not planning on raising any more. But I just say that if you're a mean, stern, austere man, father, I believe that you put that image of a father in the mind of your child. And he will never have an image of God the Father just right because he figures that if God's a father he'd be like his father mean and stern and ugly and hard to get along with you may disagree with me and you have a right to and I believe in being firm and but I I sincerely believe that all of that ought to be done with love instead of just being mean and ugly and raise your voice and yell and scream at the kids and yell and scream at your wife, yell and scream at your husband. child brought up under that sort of an atmosphere has a pretty good chance of not getting saved because he doesn't see Christianity. He doesn't have a real good idea about fatherhood of God. I... I don't know, maybe, I, 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 I know I've got a few things that are a little cockeyed, but I've always thought that it'd be pretty hard to pastor a church if you didn't have a good dad. If you didn't have a good conception of your heavenly father, it would be hard for you to sort of be like a father to a flock of people be mean and ugly and oh you know you know me pretty well I'm straightforward preach hard but I do it in love and if you can't see the love in my eyes and you you're a you're a screwball as a part of it's a part of being a, a leader is to love people even though you may be straight well I, I think that uh, my mother and dad were wonderful people. And I think it made it quite easy for me to come to sanctification and to come to the place of surrendering my life. You listen to this, man. I'm just about through with this little oration, but I just wanted, I wanted to say it to you. I thought about it this day as I've been... I've been I've been working on this lesson all morning and all afternoon and this evening too. I've, I've, this has been my mind you know, a little difficult to put it all together. But I, this is what Paul said about Timothy. He said, when I recall the un, uh, feigned faith that is in the which dwelt first in thy grandmother Lois and in thy mother Eunice, and I am persuaded that is, all, that is in thee also. There's a family here, a grandma, 
a mother and a son. And the grandma was godly, her daughter was godly, the son was godly. There was godliness displayed in that home. I'm nothing. I probably never will be very much. Oh, how thankful I am for our godly great-grandmother, whose name was Lois, and a godly mother whose name was Ethel. And when I made my consecration in 1955, I wanted to. I wanted God. I wanted his power and his blessing. I wanted, to, I wanted to be a pastor. When I was 11 years old, I've always wanted to do just what I'm doing tonight. It's exactly what I've always wanted to do. I saw it. I'm trying to tell you parents as well as children to recognize that God is perhaps setting you up to have a wonderful life and the chambers of your house will be filled with precious and pleasant things. <laughs> well, I just kind of believe that. But if there's a lot of loose talk and, and uh, loose morals and uh, things around the house, there's prayerlessness and carelessness and Oh, it won't lead to holiness and earnestness and steadfastness. Fastness. You know, just Susanna Wesley had 19 children. 19. And Charles and John, I think there were 18 and 19. I'm not sure, somewhere down the end of her line. But when I was in England, I went to see her grave. I thought that she perhaps one of the greatest women that ever lived. But she somehow instilled in those children of hers a holiness and a godliness and a desire to live a pure, holy, godly life. Our, our text, it, it's, it says that... Um, through wisdom is a house built, and by understanding it is established, and by knowledge as shall the chambers be filled with all precious and pleasant riches. Maybe, maybe you're not interested in what I'm interested in, but that's what I'm interested in. And it takes wisdom, and it takes understanding. But if any man lack wisdom, where does he get it? If any man lack wisdom, well, let him ask of God. If you don't know how to raise your children or how to answer your problems, why don't you ask God? And he'll show you. He'll help you in your Christian life. Brother and Sister Gunny, I don't think I'm going to get very far tonight with <laughs> if I heard everything else. But let me go to verse 5. A wise man is strong, yea, a man of understanding increases strength. Wisdom is stronger than physical strength. That wisdom is strength. And I can say James 1 5, if any man lack wisdom, let him ask of God that giveth to all men liberally, and abradeth not, and it shall be given him. And the more wisdom, the more knowledge, the more understanding that you get, 
the better you'll have it in this world. With wisdom, with understanding, a person can rightfully make himself a wonderful living. It takes brains. You young people that are here, don't ever corrupt your brain with drugs, with alcohol, marijuana, whatever else might affect you. You're going to need every bit of brain you got to make it through this world. You know if you, I just paid my bills today. I'm going to just, once in a while my wife and I sit down at the kitchen table and say, oh, well, what do we owe? And we paid our bills today. And I always so re rejoice over the ability to pay my bills. But if you don't plan, and if you haven't got any sense, you'll squander your money. You'll spend it on knickknacks and scarcities, and cracker jacks and chewing gum and popcorn. And that, that. <laughs> <laughs> but you'll spend your money on foolishness, and you'll not have money to pay your bills. But wisdom will give you direction for your life. And your house will be filled with precious and pleasant things. I can't, I can't say it enough. I really can't. That uh, insight, and discernment, uh, understanding it helps you. Uh, listen to me. Helps you to stay ahead of everybody else around about you. I learned secrets sometime back in my life. Of course, I'm in full-time Christian service. I studied to prepare my lesson. But just before I came over here, I laid down and slept for about 30 minutes. That put my mind at rest. That gave me an edge over you because you've worked all day and you're tired and I'm rested. And so I've got an edge on you. And you listen to this old man. I, this is not something I concocted. But Bob Jones Sr. probably, I think, one of the greatest preachers ever graced this country was old Bob Jones. He said he took a nap 30 minutes every day after lunch, 30 minutes. So well, that's, uh, that's, I haven't got time. You'd be surprised how much more time you'll have if you're rested and your mind is fresh and you can do things and think things. But when you're ready, when you're prepared, you have your message, you have your outline, you have your whatever you're going to do. In your mind, you're ahead of everybody else. On the way over tonight, I said, now, Don, you're not as sharp tonight as you could be. But you probably know a little bit more than those people you're going to teach tonight. So just tell them what you know. Could I just take a minute and tell you something? That might be long lived, and you might never forget it as long as you live. Tell me my little secrets. One day, one of my boys was in Bible college at Midwestern Baptist College. This is back in the 70s, I suppose. And he said, one of the professors told them that day, this, what I'm telling you right now, and I've thought about it, and how much wisdom there is in it. And I'm not a doctor. I, I mean by that, I am not a medical doctor. I, I'm, I'm not a psychiatrist. I do not know all that I would like to know about the structure of our human body and mind. 
But this professor told the class that we, our bodies go in cycles, like a woman has a cycle, a period that goes on in their life. We all have cycles. And he said that our cycle, intelligent cycle, will go up for about two weeks and then peak out and then go down for two weeks and then back up for two weeks and then back down for two weeks. And throughout your lifetime, you'll be running through this cycle. I don't know if you think about it much, but some mornings you could wake up and your mind would be as clear as a bell. And you could plan your work for three or four weeks. You could see your way clear for maybe a month or two because your mind had focused it. I woke up in the morning sometimes when I wondered where I was. <laughs> and I just kind of all day long kind of been in the days. You never been that way? You kind of work your way through, but you don't even know how you got there after you got through. But if you're up, on this intelligent peak, you're really sharp. You're really going places. But when you're down here in this little valley and you got to preach a sermon and your main brain is on vacation, <laughs> you better have a good outline. You better have something to fall back on. Of course, God's going to help you. You understand that. I'm not, but I'm talking about a human cycle in our lives. Now, you will probably think about that the rest of your life. I'm passing on that to you. It was given to me 30, 40 years ago, but I thought it had some merit to it. And I think if you'd think about it, you'd say it too. There must be uh, something. But uh, I, I'm just trying to say to you tonight that uh, wisdom will help you through your life. Uh, um, It'll help you to uh, actually feel better. It'll uh, keep you out of danger. Uh, isn't it good to know the answer to problems that other people are having? And they come to you and they say, I've got a problem. And I said, well, tell me, well, here, I, I'll give you the answer. It's, this is it. This is what you do. You know, it must be really quite uh, gratifying to be a medical doctor and to have all of that understanding of the human anatomy. And the patient comes in and gives their little story of what the aches and pains and problems. And they can, in their mind, have been trained and their mind has studied and knowledge has been given to them. And I said, I, I believe I know what your problem is. It's this. And writes out a prescription. You take it to the pharmacist and take these pills in a few days. You're feeling better. And I'm not saying I give all credit to the doctor. I'm not much for going to the doctor. I kind of think if you stay away from you live longer. But, <laughs> But, but on the other on the other side of the coin, you know, it, wouldn't it be nice if you could somebody come to you and have a arithmetic problem, and you'd be able to say, well, this is how you do that, or maybe some uh, other problem of normal intelligence. You might be just a little bit ahead of them. That's why you're sitting here in this class tonight, to enhance your life, to enhance your ability to be able to answer questions and be able to put things together and make decisions that are proper in your life. And I'm hoping that after all of these years, I'm an old man, but most of it's been spent in the Lord's work that you could gather something from this old man to help you. I'm not trying to tell you people that are watching on the video that I know all there is to know. It's, that's not true. I don't know. 
but I'm just passing on. That's what we all are supposed to do, is to pass on what we do know, help somebody else. Verse 7 says, Wisdom is, is what, that's verse 6. For by, for by wise counsel thou shalt make war in the multitude of counselors, there is safety. They talk a, a little bit here about making decisions and getting counsel and sitting down with other people who have some experiences, who have knowledge about that particular thing. Uh, you can make some good decisions if you would listen to the counsel and a multitude of counsel. You start about making war, talking about a king or whatever, talking to his son about perhaps being maybe Rehoboam, I don't know, because Rehoboam was the next king after him. Maybe it's done, don't, don't, don't jump at war without making counsel, without sitting down with the brain trust of the kingdom, with your cabinet, with your advisors, and consider all the ifs and ands and buts and ors, and then you make your decision about going to war. <clears throat> There's a lot could be said about that <clears throat> uh, in, in, in a Christian life, but <clears throat> it talks about being in safety. Now, I, I've never operated here at this church with a board. We don't have a board in our church. I, uh, we had a board when I came, and I, uh, it's very difficult for a man who wants to do something to have his hands tied by a board of a church who hardly understands how to make a living, let alone how to operate a church, and for them to make all these spiritual decisions. But, what I did and what I've done and what I always have done and will do is I have confided in the men. I made every man in the church the finance committee. And when I asked the witness taken for the men, said this is why they would make, I have to make a decision. And I just want you men to be with me and understand what we're doing so that it's not something to be criticized. You got a problem with it? Let me know right now and let's do it together. Let's do it together or let's don't do it at all. You understand that? That's the way I've operated. I believe that's the only reason I've stayed here for these 50 years in this church is because I haven't had to break the back of a board telling me which way to go. and I just couldn't handle it. I'm just a different kind of a person. And I'm not saying that I would recommend that for everybody. <clears throat> but it's <clears throat> Excuse me, but it's always good to know what you're doing and to have counsel with others. <clears throat> when you're going to war, especially, he's talking about it. How would you like to be drafted into the United States Army today and go to uh, Iraq tomorrow? and start fighting. Say, that's dumb, Brother Green. Well, it is dumb. I, here's Brother Cunning. He was in the Marines. I don't know how much training you got, but you probably had several years. And the drill sergeant was so sweet and kind. Oh, no, he wasn't. <laughs> he wasn't nice to you. He was mean, cruel. But why you said that's awful? Why did they do that? Did they do that to save your life? They train you how to obey orders. You said, I don't see why we shut up. Just do what I'm telling you to do. You said, Well, that isn't right. It is the only way. You have to have counsel. You have to know what you're doing before you do it. My thoughts of all of this Christian work is to get as much knowledge 
and wisdom and understanding as you can before you enter into the Lord's work. And above everything else, get the Holy Spirit's power on your life. It was told the disciples, tarry at Jerusalem until you be endued with power and then go into all the world and preach the gospel. Get your training. Know what you're doing. Get God's power on your life and then go. I think that's the right way. I went to Bible college and I graduated from Bible college and I took a church and they taught us how to win souls. They taught us how to knock on doors and bring people to church. But they never did talk to us about getting filled with the Holy Ghost power on my life. I didn't know anything about that. I went six years in the ministry without that. And it was just hell on earth. It was just me against the world. But after that moment when I surrendered to Christ was filled with the power of God, that was 50 years ago. I've had the most wonderful time of all my life, just serving God. Now, it may sound a little bit boring, but I want to tell you that tonight. There's preparations. There's counsel. And with counsel, there is safety. You know what you're doing. You've got people with you and behind you and for you to make the decisions. I'm going to do one more verse, and then I'm going to be through. Wisdom is too high for a fool. He opened up not his mouth in the gate. Now he's talking about the gate. At the gate, at the gate in the Old Testament economy, in the life of Israel, in their villages, the people who were the judges, the people who were the leaders uh, that took care of public transactions like the selling of property or the marriages or disputes like we would go to the judicial system of judgment and the judge they went to the gate that's where the judges sat. But he said a fool. The wisdom is too high for a fool. He's never going to open his mouth at the gate. He's not smart enough to be a judge or to make decisions for anybody else because he can't even take care of his own business. What are, we, what are we saying? I, I, um, a fool is a fool. And Solomon said in a couple more chapters, in chapter 27, I'm going to read this. I wrote it here in my little notes. Though thou shouldest bray a fool in a mortar among wheat, Yet will he, among wheat, with a pistol, yet he will not, yet will not his <laughs> foolishness depart from him. Excuse me, Frank, couldn't read it even with my glasses, but a, a pistol, a a mortar and a pistol. There is a, a bowl about like this, and a pistol was a piece of stone or metal, maybe this big, had a big ball on the end of it. It was so that they could take the wheat and they could pound that wheat with that pistol and crush it. And when you crush the wheat, it became flour that you could make biscuits out of, bread out of. And he said, if 
even though a man, you could put a pool in a, you could put a pool in a, in a bowl, in a, and try to pound some sense in his head. He's still a fool. The connotation of all of this is, if you're a fool, you'll probably be one all of your life. Unless something wonderful would take place in your life and you get saved. If you don't get saved, you're going to just about stay on the same trend that you've always been. I've said this a lot of times. You've heard me say it. <clears throat> if you were a brat when you were a kid, you'll probably be a brat all your life. Because nobody has ever conquered you in your spirit. If you're a smart aleck, cocky, proud, arrogant when you're a kid. You'll probably be that way when you're 90 years old, if you live that long. If you're a thug and a thief and a crook when you're a kid, you'll probably be one all your life. Unless, unless somewhere down in your life, you have some major change come in your life. Either get saved or really get down to business and serve God God can take a fool, even a wayfaring man. God can take fools and, and make wise even the simplest fool. An ignorant person can have wisdom. All they got to do is ask God and get down and humbly before God, and he can put some smarts in your head. I know some of you sitting here, you'd say, I'm dumb. I'm not smart at all. I really never really could be much of a leader. That's what this class is, leadership. But you'd be surprised if you humble yourself before God and seek wisdom, seek knowledge, seek understanding. He's able to make wise the simple. The stupidest person in this class and one of you would raise your hand if I'd ask who it was. It's me. 